Amen. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to praise you, to worship you, to bless your name. Now, Lord, Father God, we come before you thanking you, Father God, for your word. We thank you for the power of your word, the value of your word. We ask you to bless us now as we look through your word. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins and bless us, Father God, to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Let me call your attention to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8. In the Old Testament, the book is Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8. We'll be looking at verses 5 and 6, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. In the Old Testament, the book is Nehemiah. The chapter is 8, verses are 5 and 6. Will you stand for the reading of the Word of God? And that statement is more fitting today than ever before. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. When you found it, you will discover these words. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I want to talk about the value of God's word. The value of God's word. Today we value many words and the, the words of many people. Today, today we have great confidence in Dr. Fauci. We look, we try to see, we glance, and we listen for the words of Dr. Fauci. We look, we look forward to hearing his report. Most of us who have good sense look forward to following his scientific mind. Most of us look forward to hearing the words that that Dr. Fauci would say, we look forward to hearing that, that the virus has gone on back to hell where it came from. <laughs> we value the words of Dr. Fauci. Amen. But I want to tell you today, we ought to value the word of God. Right. We ought to have great confidence in the word of God. I thank you for tuning in. I thank you for sitting in. I thank you for standing for the word because there's great value in the word of God. God's word has great value. His value, his word is a valuable piece of literature. We ought to always value the word of God above everybody else's word. What do you mean? What do you mean, preacher? We ought to value the word of God because it's God's word that keeps us. It's God's word that guides us. And it is God's word that will reward us. That's why, that's why during this season, we, we are reading God's word daily. Say amen if you can. Amen. We are reading God's word daily. We are, we are standing behind God's word every single day of our lives. We are standing on God's words. We are standing by God's word. We are leaning and depending on God's word. Are you doing that? It is God's word that keeps us sane. It is God's word that keeps us sane. If it had not been for God's words, you would have lost your mind. And if it had not been for God's word, the last person that made you mad would have been sad. If it had not been for God's word, men would be still doing their due. Women would still be acting like they used to act. But because God's word resonates in their mind, they have changed. 
They've been given hope. They've been renewed. Thank God. Thank God for his word. When we look at the text, when we look at the text in Nehemiah, you will find one of our daily readings for my Sunday school class. I'm appreciative. I'm appreciative of our Sunday school teachers because they are delivering God's word uh, with an authentic message. I am grateful that, that they are not changing God's word. I am grateful that they are not putting their own twist on God's word. I am grateful that they are walking through God's word because they are not extra biblical. You know, extra biblical means when, when you add something to it or you take something away from it. And whenever you add something to God's word or take something away from God's word, let me tell you, you begin to lie on God. If you say that somebody said it and they didn't say it, what is it? It's a lie. So when you say that God is saying something and you have not done your study and you have not prepared yourself through adequate research, then you have lied on God. And God's word is too valuable to get it twisted. God's word is what sustains us. God's word is what keeps us. That's why we're reading daily. We're studying daily. Say amen if you can. We are looking at God's word. We have a passage every single day that we're looking at that leads up to our Sunday school lesson. It's called our daily reading for Sunday school. I spend time late at night taking pictures and sending it to you. I spend time early in the morning taking pictures and sending it to you. And now we got the kind of phone where we can actually program it to send it later on. So in my midnight hours while you asleep, I can program it to show up at your place on your phone at 7.45 a.m., 8 o'clock a.m., 11 o'clock a.m. on Monday morning because God's word is valuable to us. Is God's word valuable to you? Is God's word making a difference in your life? If, you, if it had not been for God's word, you would have given up on yourself. If it had not been for God's word, you would have lost yourself. If it had not been for God's word, matter of fact, you would be on your way to hell. But God's word has rescued us, yeah, yeah. has made us who we are, who he has redeemed us. He has blessed us. Also, we are, we are listening to God's words on a daily basis. We are listening to God's word. We are going down through God's word on a daily basis through our schedule. And when we get behind, we catch up because we value God's word. Everybody in the house got mask on, so I can't see if you, you, you got to say amen. <laughs> amen. I, I can't see if you really, if you really, really, really are, are listening. If you really, really reading or you really studying. When we look at Nehemiah chapter 8, we find Nehemiah who had left his country. He is a, a cup bearer. And now he hears word that Jerusalem's walls are torn down. He gets word that his, his hometown is messed up. He gets word that his country has been messed up for a long time. The, the walls have been torn down and, and fires have taken over. It's been burnt down. So he goes to the king. He's a cupbearer for the king. The king values him and he values the king. So he goes to the king and when he goes to the king, he asks the king for permission to go back home. He asks the king for permission to go back and make a difference. Let me tell you, regardless of where you have come from, regardless of where you've been, regardless of where you have traveled, let me tell you, you ought to go back home and make a difference. You ought to go back home sometime and, and just make a difference. You ought to go back home sometime and sow seed back into those who have sown seed into you. Amen. You ought to go back home and visit the, the senior saints sometime. You, you ought to go back home and, and, and rebuild your community. So Nehemiah gets permission and he gets letters so he can pass through every town that he goes through. 
Nehemiah gets the letter. He wants to make sure he can build back the walls and build back the city where he came from. He got the bad news that Jerusalem has fallen. He gets the bad news that the fire has taken over. He wants to go back and rebuild his city. Nehemiah goes back, and when he began the building process, there were some haters present. You got any haters in your life? <laughs> you, you got anybody who, who look at you doing the right thing and want to criticize you for doing the right thing? You don't have anybody in your life that you're trying to do what's right, you're trying to do what's good, you're trying to do what's, what's right before the Lord, and they always got something to say. Amen. Just to name two, Sanballat and Tobias. They, they were fighting against Nehemiah. They, they were coming up against Nehemiah. And let me just share with you, Nehemiah had to arm some men in order to fight the battle. Now here he is, he's, he's up on top of the wall, he, he's up on top of the building, he's up on top of the roof, and they say, come down, I want to talk to you. Let me tell you, that, that your haters got tricks for you. They want to disturb what you're doing, they, they want to stop you from what you're doing, even though they are doing no good. Are there any witnesses in the house? So he, so Sanballat and Tobias come by, Sanballat and Tobias come by, and they said, come on down. Then they start making fun of him. Mm. Don't you know when you're doing a good work, when you're doing a great thing, somebody's always going to make fun of you? Right. When you're going out your way to make sure that the city is rebuilt, when you're going out your way to take care of youth and young people, somebody will always have something to say. God deliver me from folk that always got something to say regardless of what you're doing, but they are doing nothing. So they made their way, and then they got an army of people to come and stop them from building. There's always somebody that's on a demolition crew when you're on a construction crew. There's always somebody that's on a demolition crew. They want to tear down. But let me just share with you, if you have a person in your life who never have anything good to say, who's never on the construction crew, please don't keep them in your life because if they're not on the construction crew, they're on the demolition crew. They want to tear it down. They want to tear it down. They, they want to destroy it. They want to destroy it in such a way that they want to say, I told you so. So they begin to make fun of them. Say, so even a little fox, if he falls on that, it will knock it down. It will be torn down to the ground. What make you think that you can build this city and this wall back? There'll be always somebody who will question your good deeds. So he moves. He, he moves to the point where he has to get armed guards to protect him and the ones who are building. Oh, it says something to me today, church, that even the Lord... <laughs> Want us to watch, fight, and pray. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said, I said it, the Lord wants us to watch, fight, and pray. Mm -hmm. The Lord wants us to stand guard. Don't get so, so, so holy. Don't get so saved until you get to the point where I can't deal with weapons because that's just not of God. God will protect me. But in the text, in the text, Brother Steptoe, in the text, it declares that it declares in the text that he called the men and told them to work with one hand and hold your guns in the other. Right. God delivered me from folk that says weapons have no place even in the church. Let me just share with you. If, if, if a man is going to, to destroy this house, they're going to take over the house, but they have to first bind the strong man. Brother Nell Lost, nobody can come in your house. No one can come in your house and take over your house while you're there. I don't care if you're going to get a stick. I don't care if you're going to get a knife. You're going to protect what is yours. If you don't, then you are less than Christian. So we find in the text where he got them to be armed men. And as armed men, they worked with one hand. And they armed themselves with the other. Mm -hmm. They stood watch. They, they were not naive. They were not sticking their head in the sand and saying, God is going to bless us anyhow. <laughs> Back home, there was a funeral home. 
I don't know if it's still there or not. The funeral home back home was, was, was called Smith and Dillon. The funeral home back home was called Smith and Dillon. And every time, every now and then, when someone got into a fight, what the person would say, you better hope that God bless you because Smith and Dillon going to dress you. Well, what he was saying is, what he's saying is, if you don't stop your shenanigans, if you don't stop what you're doing, if you don't leave me alone, you better hope that God blesses you enough for you to go to heaven when you die because Smith and Dylan going to dress you. Yeah, yeah, he said, he said that, that I want to let you know that, that, that I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to look out for myself. And I know we want to teach our children to always be nonviolent. But we have to also teach them to stand up for themselves. We have to teach them that the Bible says that they work with one hand and they arm themselves with the other. So after the wall was built, we find ourselves in chapter 8 of Nehemiah. When we look at Nehemiah chapter 8, the Bible says there was a gathering of those who obeyed God. Let me just tell you, the people, the people had a bad reputation because they had fallen away from God. They had left God. They had not done what God had told them to do. They were in a bad way. Can you identify with them? Have you ever left God? Have you ever been disobedient to God? Have you ever not walked with God? Come on, you can tell the truth now. If you won't tell the truth, let me testify. I've been in a bad way. I messed up. I've fallen short. And I've fallen short even as a preacher, I messed up. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about keeping your skeletons quiet. You don't have to worry about hiding your skeletons in the closet. Because I have a whole dead corpse in mind. And every now and then, that dead man tries to rise up and get alive again. Let me just share with you, I can't look down my nose at you because I'm messed up too. In the days of Isaiah, Isaiah says it was in the year that King Uzziah died that I also saw the Lord. I saw him high and lifted up. I saw his train fill the temple and the doorpost move. It wasn't until he got the man out of the way that he could see God. I'm telling you today, you've got to get some people out of the way. So you can see God. You have to move some people over so you can see God. You have to move about so you can see God. You have to move around so you can see God. And all of us have friends that are that are good friends. All of us have friends that mean well. All of us have friends that been our ride and die. All of us had friends that was our ace in the whole coon boom coon. All of us have had some friends that we worked with, we walked with, we parted with, and we celebrated with. But if your friend has walked away from God, you need to watch yourself. All right, all right. Psalm, Psalm number one says, if you walk with them, you'll find yourself talking to them. You'll find yourself sitting to, with them. You will find yourself sinning with them. You will find yourself laying down with them. And Big Mama used to say it like this. If you lay down with dogs, you will get up with fleas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look at the text. In Nehemiah chapter 8, the Bible says they assembled. They got together. They congregated. They got together as one man. This phrase, one man, means they were unified. What would it be like if today's church was unified? What would it be like if the church of today had one man mentality, they stood together, and regardless of what came up, the devil couldn't shake the church? Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the very gates of hell should not prevail against it. Jesus says upon this rock, upon Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus has built his church and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against her because it's built, it's founded, it's stationized, it's stable on a solid rock. Are you on a solid rock? Are you on the rock that is Jesus? 
Are you on that rock that, that the devil and hell cannot shake? It's because Jesus is there and Jesus makes the sun. Right. So they came in on one accord. They came in as one man. They came in unified. When we move to verse number five, Nehemiah chapter eight, verse number five, we find that Ezra opened the book in sight of all the people. And let me tell you, the people that were there was every man, every woman, and every child that could understand. Thank you, baby, for being here today. Thank you for being a part of our service. The Bible says that they came in, every man, every woman, and every child that got an understanding. Yeah. Thank you. It says that when they got there, Ezra opened the book. What book? The book of the law, the book of Moses. He opened the book and he began to read. My first point today is we need to read the book. We need to read the book. We need to spend some time reading the book. We got to spend some time meditating on the book. We got to make sure we stick to the book. So he found himself reading the book. The next thing I see in the text, not only should we read the book, the preacher read the book. God deliver me from preachers that don't read the book. It says Ezra, the preacher, Ezra, the priest, Ezra, the one who was leading, he read the book. You can tell when the preacher hasn't read the book, can't you? You can tell when the preacher has not has not gotten himself in the book, has not been, been saturated in the book. The first point today is we must read the book. We must read the word. We must read the word of God. We must meditate on God's word. We must spend some time in God's word. I can tell when new beginning members are not in the book. I can tell when new beginning members are not in the book. Matter of fact, I can tell which one of new beginning members are not in the book. Because when you're in the book, when you're reading the book, when, when you're reading the word of God, when you spend time in the word of God, your attitude changes. When you see somebody on Sunday and they declare they, they ain't had a good day, it's because they hadn't been in the book. <laughs> when you see them on Monday, and they really are all shaken up and all messed up and, and they use long words and short words that they don't say in church. It's because they ain't in the book. When you read the book, the book transforms your life. So my first point is we need to read the book. Look at what it says. It says that Ezra stood up. He opened the book in the sight of all the people. And guess what? We ought to read the book in private and we ought to read the book in public. Are y'all listening to me today? <laughs> you ought to read the book in private and you ought to read the book in public. This book, this book is so powerful. This, this book is so valuable. We ought to continually read the book. He says, he said that, that he says that, that Ezra opened the book in the sight of people. And that, my next thing to you is not only should we read it in public, not only should we read it in private, we should read it before the people. We should read it before the people. We ought to read the book even before the people. Then he says, he says in the text, he says, for he was standing above all the people. He was standing above all the people. Now, let me tell you, he is simply talking about the pulpit. When you read back in, in previous ch chapters, as well as in this chapter, you will find when Ezra got up to minister, he stood on a wooden platform. And this wooden platform was only there just because he needed the people to see him and he needed to see the people. That's why I look to this side and then I look to this side because I want to see the people and I want to verify that the people see me. Yeah, he, he stood on a wooden platform. It says he stood on a wooden platform. He stood above the people. Let me just stop right here and let you know, it's not talking about he stood above the people because he stood with an attitude that he was better than the people. He didn't stand that he was better than the people, higher than the people. He only positioned himself higher so the people could see him and he can see the people. Because let me tell you this morning, y'all, I'm not any higher than you are. I am trying to do the same thing you're trying to do. Live right before the Lord. 
I want to make sure that I can get some stars in my crown. I want to make sure when I get to heaven, I won't be pushed off in the corner somewhere. I want to lead as many people to Christ. I want to speak to as many people about Christ. And I want to make sure that I obey the book. All right, man. It says, it says Ezra was, was positioned higher than the people. This thought is brought out in the New Testament where the Bible says that Jesus pushed away from the shore into the presence of the people. He moved back in the boat. Let me just share with you, the boat was Jesus' pulpit. And let me tell you another thing why I know that I'm not higher than you is because it is a pulpit. And the idea with the pulpit is to stand higher, first of all, but secondly, because the pulpit ought to be given a word from the Lord so we can pull the folk in the pit out of the pit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's why. That's why. The only reason I'm here is so I can help you get pulled out of the pit. I want to help you get pulled out the pit. And let me tell you, the reason why I go here, other preachers preach, and the reason why I go to revival is because I need to be pulled out of the pit. All right, now. I'm telling you, we need to be pulled out of the pit. The Bible says that he was higher than they were. Yeah. He was reading the book. He was higher on an elevated plane, yeah. so much so until he could see the people and the people could see him. For he was standing above all the people. Yeah. And when he opened it, when he opened what? When he opened the book. When he opened the word of God. Look what happened. Look what happened. And my next point is you got to respect God's word. You got to have some respect for God's word. And when he opened it, when he opened the book, all the people did what? Stood up. You know, we stand before the judge when, when the bailiff said, Today... All rise. We are now in the hands of the Honorable Joe Blow. And if you in that courtroom, you're going to be standing up or you're going to have handcuffs. If we stand before the judge, why, we, why can't we stand before the righteous judge himself? We got to respect the word. We, we ought to admire the word. We have to respect the word in such a way until we stand for the word. There have been several times, there have been several times at the New Beginning Church I've had to say, will you please stand for the reading of the word? You see, it's biblical. It's in the book. They stood out of reverence for the word. They stood out of respect for the word. These people, he didn't, it didn't say that he stood up and he told them to stand up. They stood because they had respect for the word of God. I know respect for parents is parents is gone. I know respect for children has disappeared. I know that respect for church is no longer. I know that respect for the word of God is slowly dwindling away. But I want to tell you respect for the word ought to still live at the New Beginning Church. We stand because now when people ask you because people ask you why y'all have to stand? For the word of God. Why that preacher want y'all to stand? Because it's in the book. The book says that when Ezra stood and he opened up the word, the people stood out of respect for the word. They stood. They stood up out of respect for the word. Verse 6 says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. My next point to you is there ought to be a time of renewal. And it says that Ezra blessed the Lord. The preacher ought to lead out in blessing the Lord. God deliver me from preachers that are dressed too well to bless the Lord. They got their make on up on too good to bless the Lord. God deliver me from the preacher who do not have the audacity to raise his hand before the Lord and say, Lord, I bless you. Lord, I glorify you. Lord, I magnify you. God, I praise you for just being who you are. The preacher ought to bless the Lord. Yeah, the preacher. The preacher ought to bless the Lord. The preacher ought to have sense enough. The preacher ought to have guidance enough. The preacher ought to have the willpower to bless the Lord. 
I went to a funeral one day and we went out to the cemetery. You know, in the, in the country, they got the cemetery right next door to the church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the country, they, you walk out the door, right. you take 10 steps, and you hear the preacher say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and earth to earth, right outside of the church. Maybe that's why so many people stayed away from the church, that because they thought the dead was going to get up and run them away from the church. <laughs> but let me tell you, those who are already dead, you don't have to worry about them. You have to worry about those that still breathing, still walking around, heart is still moving. You need to concern yourself with those. So I was at the, at the funeral, and I was I was assisting another pastor, and we were from out of town. But the pastor who preached the sermon was leading the interment at the cemetery. All of a sudden, the two of us that were from out of town were standing there. The people were coming, but the pra the pastor that was going to deposit the body is still lagging around. I mean, the cemetery is 10 feet away. The cemetery is right outside the door. So the pastor standing next to me said, hey, you know what? The people should not stand and watch the preacher walk up. The preacher ought to stand and watch the people walk up. You know, the preacher ought to be there when nobody else is there. All right. I, I know new beginning. I know when you pull up for Sunday school on Sunday, if you don't see my truck or you don't yeah. see Sister David's car, first thing you say, where is Pastor David? My question to you is, how do you know I'm not already here? How do you know I'm going to be here? And how do you know I'm not going to be here? It's because you've gotten used to the preacher being here before anybody else shows up. Amen. You've gotten used to it. You've gotten used to it. You ought to get used to it. To the preacher leading the way in praise, the preacher leading the way in worship, the preacher ought to call the people to renewal. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a renewal process. The preacher ought to call the people to renewal. Somebody said, you sure are hard on these preachers today. Well, I'm one of them, so I can talk about this. <laughs> there are two groups I can talk about. I can talk about, well, three groups I can talk about. And I can talk about them standing flat-footed. Number one, I can talk about electronic technicians because I, I've been one of them. Number two, I can talk about engineers because I, I, I've been one of them. And I can talk about preachers and pastors because today I'm one of them. And let me tell you, it's a sad day when the preacher don't lead the people in worship. It's a sad day when the preacher is not there when everybody else shows up. So now you're going to be looking forward to it. You're going to be saying, now he was here for 17 years. Now where is he today? The Bible says in verse number six, turn it down, Sister Wood. The Bible says in verse number six, the Bible says in verse number six, then all the people answered, amen, amen. and amen. amen. I want to tell you today, I want to tell you right, right here today that there ought to be some response. There ought to be, when the word of God goes forth, there ought to be some amen and amen. When the word of God goes forth, we, we, ought, we ought not be talking about high five, just say amen. When, when the word of God goes forth, we ought to say amen because amen says it is so. It is so. Amen. amen says that I believe it, preacher. Uh -huh. And let me just share right here. Uh, when, when you say amen to the preacher, it's like saying sick him to the dog. <laughs> I just thought I'd tell you that, Sister Nella. <laughs> and when you say amen to the preacher, Sister Darrington, when you say amen to the preacher, it's like saying sick him and that dog takes off. But the Bible says you ought to say amen to the truth. The Bible says they were saying amen to the word of God. We too busy saying it is so to our supervisor, but we won't say amen to, to the word of God. So there ought to be some response. Yeah, there ought to be some reading. There ought to be some reading of the word. There ought to be some reading. There ought to be some respect for the word. There ought to be some respect for the word. The Bible said they stood up. There ought to be some renewal for the word. There ought to be some responding to the word. And finally, there ought to be some repentance before the word. There ought to be some repentance. I'm telling you, they ought, they ought to repent. They ought to call themselves out before the Lord. They ought to confess it before the Lord. I didn't say they ought to confess it before you. I said they ought to confess it before the Lord. I know the scripture says that confess your faults one to the other. We got Facebook now. 
We got Twitter now. We got, we got text messages now. We got telephones that we got on our persons everywhere we go. We got phone now. And if you confess it to your brother today, everybody around town will know it before you get to the house. Somebody texting right now. Somebody texting right now. Somebody, somebody is on the phone right now. Some, somebody is telling somebody something right now. Confess it to the Lord. There, there ought to be some repentance. Where is it in the text, preacher? Right there in verse number six. It says, es Ezra blessed the Lord. He blessed the great God. Amen. Then all the people answered, Amen. 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 While, while lifting up their hands, they were repenting. They were, they were celebrating. First of all, you see the preacher celebrating God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you see the people celebrating God. You not only see the people saying amen, but they also are celebrating God because of who God is. He says, he celebrate, the text says that he's celebrating the great God, the Lord himself. Let me just tell you, don't get caught up in celebrating your car. Don't get caught up in celebrating your house. Don't get caught up in celebrating your spouse. Surely don't get caught up in celebrating your children. You need to get caught up with celebrating God. You got to celebrate God. The Bible says, as they lifted up their hands, they bowed down their heads and their faces. They had to repent because they had sinned. They had to repent because they fallen short. They had been, they had been all out there. They had, they had gone all out of the way to see. You know, I, I used to hear him back home saying, God forgive us for our sins of commission. In our sins of omission. Yeah. I was full grown, Brother Stepto, before I realized what was going on. <laughs> Them Mississippi folk, you know who I'm saying. Those Mississippi folk, they knew how to talk. And they knew how to talk to God. And let me just share with you. Big Mama didn't have a third grade education, but she had a connection with God. Yeah. Big Daddy didn't have a first grade education, but he had a connection with God. Yeah. And let me tell you, when you got a connection with God, you can do things that other folk can't do with a little of nothing. Yeah. Let me tell you, I never heard of a, of a person that, that back home that was a seasoned saint losing their houses. I never heard of a person, a senior seasoned saint that worshiped the Lord lose their cause. I never heard of a person back home going into bankruptcy if they loved the Lord. I never heard of a person back home, regardless of what they had gone through, walk around like they got a ship chip on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. They worship God. Yeah. Matter of fact, the folk that had telephones back home, they still got the same phone number today. Amen. <laughs> Let's fast forward from the 20th century to the 21st century. All right, man. Some of you all have had 10 phones with 10 different phone numbers in two years. Some of you have had one house after the other and then you turn in one car after the other because you don't have connection with God. It's because they had connection with God. And don't talk about tithing. Our big mama would say it like this. She said, yeah, I'm on a fixed income, but God fixed it. And because God fixed it, yeah. I'm going to give him 10% plus something. I'm, not only am I going to bless the Lord with my 10%, he gave me health and strength. I'm going to bless him with two more percent. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. bless him with five more percent. Yeah. It's because we have gotten so down on ourselves, we got 20, 30, 40 different bills. Yeah. And we said, we got to pay our bills. Yeah, you do have to pay yeah. your bills. But you ought to return back to God what God has given you. Right, return it back to God. Return it. That's why you don't give tithes and offering. Mm -hmm. You return tithes and offering. Mm -hmm. you, you have to return it. You see, tithes and offering is an is a, is a element of the heart. Yeah. When your heart is right, yeah. when your heart is right, you don't have any questions about it. When your heart is turned toward God, when you honor God, when you respect God, when you respect God's word, then you have no problem with returning what God has already done. Amen. Let me just say to you this. I didn't say this. Another preacher said this, so don't throw a rock at me. <laughs> the preacher says that Malachi says a man will rob God. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, he have in tithes and offerings. Yes. And he says, I, you are cursed with a curse. Yes. Not just your house, the whole nation is cursed with a curse. And he says, try me and see. Yes. That I will not pour out a, a, I will open up a window from heaven. Yes. Yes. And pour you out blessings that you have no room to receive. Yes. Yes. Now this is, what, this is the part that the preacher said. The preacher says that God called them a rock. And the preacher said, you could be sitting next to a rock. The preacher says that a robber is when somebody sticks you up while you're looking at it. So we sticking God up while we while God's looking at us. And then let me tell you what else the preacher said. The preacher says, if they will rob God, what make you think they won't rob you? All right. Woo. It's cold turkey, but it's good when you're hungry. It's good when you're hungry. It's good when you're hungry. The Bible says they bow down their heads and worship. They worship the Lord with their heads and their faces bowed to the ground. I say to you today, you must respond the right way. You must respond in such a way that you're humble before God. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God pierces deep between the marrow and the bone. The word of God is our hope. The word of God is our strength. It was God's word. John says in John 1, it says it's God's word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God. And the word was in the beginning before the beginning began. And then verse 14 of John 1 says, And the word walked around with us. It dwelled on these mountain shores. The word is Jesus the Christ. He is real today. He lives today. Over 2,000 years ago, he died for you, and he died for me. They killed him. They hung him on a cross. They killed the word. They killed him, and they thought he was finished. They took him off the cross, laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because he didn't need it too long. All of that third day morning, all of that third day morning, all of that third day morning, he got up with all power. And heaven and earth in his hand. That same Jesus... He lives. Yes. Songwriter said he lives. Yeah. I know he lives. Yes. He walks with me. Yes. He talks with me. Yes. And he tells me yes. I am his own. Yes. I know he lives. Yes. Yeah, we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday. Yes. I know he lives. When I see the sun makes his way from the eastern hemisphere. Yes over to the western hemisphere. I'm reminded that Jesus lives. When I see the sun go down in the western hemisphere, I'm reminded that Jesus lives. When I come to the house of the Lord and I see you waving your hand, clapping your hand, celebrating God, I'm reminded that Jesus lives. But most of all, when I look over the shoulders of my life and I see what God has already brought me, I know he lives. He walks with me. He talks with me. He has changed my life. He has caused renewal. He has caused repentance. And he has my respect. Yes. Hallelujah to the Lamb. The door of the church is open. Amen. The door of the church is open. Yes. The door is open. Yes, the door is open. This is your moment. Yes. The door is open. Yes. To get to know him, this is your moment. Yes. The door is open. You can come to Jesus. He died for you. Yes. He was buried for you. Yes. He rose for you. Yes. He ascended for you. And he's coming back for you. Oh, yes. The door is open. Yes, the invitation is extended. Yes. You ought to come to Jesus. Yes, Just as you are. Yes, I had to come. Yes. Just as I was. Yes. Weary. Wounded. Yes. And sad. Yes. But he, he gave me a resting place. Yes. And for that, I made, he made me glad. Yes. Hallelujah to the Lamb. If you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, you can come right now. You can come by letter. You can come by Christian experience. And you can come by salvation. You can come by baptism. The door is open. This is your moment. You can get to know him. If you're listening to this broadcast, you can get to know Jesus in the departing of your sins. Just confess your sins. Just repent of your sins. And be responsive to the message. The door is open. If you never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, just repeat after me and he will come in. Amen. 
into your life and make you a new person. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. We believe if you prayed this prayer, honestly believing the story that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead, you are now born again. And when you die, you're on your way to heaven. And when Jesus come back to get his, his church, you will leave and go with him. Yeah. And there may be others of you who have walked away, who have fallen out with the church, fallen out with the preacher, fallen out with your Sunday school teacher, fallen out with your discipleship leader. This is your moment. You can repent right now. These people fell on their faces, yeah. on the ground. They fell up their face on their faces and repented of their sins. They humbled themselves yeah. before the Lord. Yeah. I want to pray with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you now for these who have come, yeah. for these who want to repent, yeah. for those who have fallen short, yeah. for those who want renewal, yeah. for those who want rededication, yeah. for those who want recommitment. Yeah. We ask you to bless them now. Yeah. Keep them now. Draw them by way of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. There may be others of you who don't have a church home. Or you're in between church homes. This is your moment. You are welcome to the New Beginning Church. Whether you're locally or in a far distant land. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to be a, a member of the New Beginning Church. If you're here today and you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church, you can come now. The door is open. The invitation is extended. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for his word. I value the word of God. I value his word. I value his word. His word is valuable. His word. CNN has a word, but it's not a valuable word. 50 minus... <laughs> 50 minus 5 got a word. And he's causing people to go a long way before God. Men are bowing down to a statue of an ugly man. If you're going to build a statue, at least make it attractive. At least make it beautiful. At least, make, But I guess it's hard to make a, a pretty statue of an ugly man. And people are bowing down before a statue in the 21st century. I'm not talking about in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm talking about in the 21st century. Amen. People are bowing down yeah. before a statue of a man. Yeah. God is the only one yeah. in which we ought to bow down. Yeah. God is the only one yeah. who can make life right. Mm. We ought to bow down yeah. before him. Yeah. The Bible says they bowed down before the Lord with their faces to the ground. Hallelujah to the Lord. Well, we thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We thank God for blessing us and keeping us. We thank God for making a way out of no way. We thank God for who he is. He is the awesome and the amazing God. Nehemiah says he's the great God. <laughs> he is the God who does great things. He does them well. It's now offering time. It's time to give back to the Lord. Hallelujah. I said it's time to give to the Lord. I didn't say it's time to give to the preacher. It's time to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. It is time to give to the Lord. Your envelopes are at the back door. You can pick up your envelopes. Uh, this is a great time. We're still in church. We, we want to honor God with our gifts. As I said to you, that we don't give tithes. We return tithes because God has blessed us with it all. Amen. Let's go before God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that we value your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for blessing us through your word. We thank you, Father God, for keeping your word. God, you are a promise keeper. You kept us through your word. And for that, we glorify you. We thank you now. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come to give unto you. Bless our gifts, Father God. Bless us in our giving. Bless us, Father God, that we will give not grudgingly, nor out of necessity. 
necessity. For God, we know you love a cheerful giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Let me give you some giving music. I want you to, to, to hang in there with me. I want to give you some giving music. And, and, uh, I know you're looking at me when I sit down here. But God is a great God. He, yes, he I told you God can do anything. Didn't yes, <laughs> he can do anything. With no other power, Holy Ghost power, he can do. <laughs> you ought to sing with me. God specializes. And things impossible. That's all right. I just play it. Y'all can't sing with me. I, I just play it. Y'all, y'all can't sing with me. Amen. I want to give you some some giving music here, so we can give unto the Lord. Amen. <laughs> souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you. Father God, we thank you now for this, your word. We thank you, Father God, that your word is valuable to us. We thank you, Lord, that your word, Father God, is what we need in times like these. We thank you for the ability to read your word. We thank you that we respect your word. We thank you that your word offers renewal. Lord, we thank you that your word leads us into repentance. And Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us to respond well to your word. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us say, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. You are dismissed.